I have been assigned the task to prepare this talk on hysteroscopy. I soon learned that this topic is quite broad and unfortunately, I won't be able to cover all aspects. However, there is much to learn and I hope everyone who listens will appreciate this not so minor art. Hysteroscopy has been around for quite some time. The first description of a utron endoscope dates back to 1869. However, due to its rudimentary design and its inability to distend the uterus, it was rendered an inoperative instrument. Here are some diagrams that illustrate the early endoscope. Note the candle in the bottom right. In the 1920s, carbon dioxide was incorporated to distend the uterine cavity, and this allowed improved visualization. It was only in the 1980s that liquid media was used routinely. Today, we utilize hysteroscopy for multiple indications. These can be divided into diagnostic and operative. Diagnostic hysteroscopy is mainly used to evaluate abnormal uterine bleeding and infertility. On the other hand, Operative hysteroscopy can be utilized for the treatment of polyps, submucous fibroids, retained products of conception, uterine septums, intrauterine adhesions, tubal sterilization, and ablative therapy. We will now take a closer look at the hysteroscope. Most often, a rigid hysteroscope is used. It consists of an outer sheath which surrounds the telescope, distending media inflow and outflow channels, and at times, separate channels for operative instruments. The hysteroscope's telescope consists of three parts, the eyepiece, barrel, and objective lens. The surgeon can look directly through the eyepiece or view the image via a video monitoring system. Illumination for hysteroscopy is provided by a light source connected to the hysteroscope by a fiber optic cable. Fiber optics allow transmission of bright light without the transmission of significant heat. Most light sources are either halogen or xenon. The telescope has varying viewing angles. These range from 0 to 70 degrees. As illustrated in the pictures, a 0 degree hysteroscope provides a panoramic view in line with the sheath. Hysteroscopes with larger viewing angles will allow the surgeon to visualize areas to the left or right of midline without shifting the telescope from side to side. The sheath is a metal tube that houses the telescope and instruments. Both diagnostic and operative sheaths are fitted with stopcocks for ports for the installation of distending media. Some operative sheaths have dual ports that provide continuous laminar flow of distending media. This helps to clear blood and thus improves visualization of the uterine cavity. Some diagnostic hysteroscopes permit targeted biopsies and retrieval of foreign bodies. Simple operative sheaths use the distending media channel for the insertion of instruments, although this method is easy and allows one to use a small diameter sheath, leaks of media are common. Advanced operative sheaths may have three channels, two for operative instruments and one for instilling distending media. Other operative sheaths contain permanently attached operative tools, such as biopsy instruments, forceps, or scissors. An important aspect of hysteroscopy is the total outer diameter of a hysteroscope. Essentially, this refers to the diameter of the sheath. Sheath outer diameters range from 3.1 to 10 millimeters. Smaller outer diameter hysteroscopes cause less pain and decrease the need for mechanical dilation. Diagnostic procedures performed with smaller diameter sheaths can usually be performed in the office. In general, inserting a sheath with a diameter more than 5 millimeters will require mechanical cervical dilation. These patients will experience discomfort and will require analgesia like a paracervical block at the very least. As mentioned before, most hysteroscopes are rigid, but narrow caliber scopes may also be semi-rigid or flexible. Rigid hysteroscopes 
cause more intraoperative pain, but offer better optical quality and are less costly. Flexible hysteroscopy is especially useful in patients with an irregularly shaped uterus, as the distal tip can be deflected upward or downward. Operative hysteroscopes are used to remove endocervical or endometrial lesions, like submucosal myomas and endometrial polyps, or to perform endometrial ablations. There are three types of operative hysteroscopes. An operative sheath with instruments inserted through channels or fixed to the sheath, an electrosurgical resectoscope, and a hysteroscopic morselator. Here is an example of the first type and some instruments. These flexible and semi-rigid instruments range in diameter from 2 to 3 millimeters and are inserted through an operating channel in the sheath. Some systems have sheaths which use suction to retrieve tissue fragments without removing the hysteroscope. Here is an example of a resectoscope and some of its electrosurgical instruments. Resectoscopes typically consist of a 7 to 9 mm sheath. They use radio frequency electrical energy, which may be either monopolar or bipolar. When monopolar resectoscope is used, the patient must be grounded and a non-conducting, or in other words, a non-electrolyte distending medium must be used. Bipolar resectoscopes are a newer development and can be used with electrolyte distending media. Traditionally, radio frequency tools for the resectoscope have included the loop for tissue cutting and a roller ball for coagulation. However, newer vaporizing electrodes like the VersaPoint have been introduced. These electrodes vaporize lesions and thus eliminates the need to remove floating pieces of tissue. Of course, they are not appropriate for procedures in which a specimen is needed for histology. The third type of hysteroscope is the hysteroscopic morselator. It consists of a rotary blade that cuts lesions and this tissue is then aspirated through the morselator. Morselators, which are inserted through the working channel of hysteroscopes, exist for use with 6, 7 and 9 mm hysteroscopes. The morselator does not use radio frequency electrical energy and thus is not able to agulate bleeding vessels. In order to get a global view of the endometrial cavity, it needs to be distended. For this, a distending medium is required. Carbon dioxide and low viscosity fluids are the most frequently used. In the next section, I will review advantages, disadvantages, and safety concerns of each. The ideal distending medium allows clear visualization, is non-conductive, in order to avoid electrocautery related injury and inexpensive. Also, since it is absorbed, a medium should be non-toxic, hyperallergenic, non-hemolytic, isosmolar, and rapidly cleared from the body. Carbon dioxide is the only gaseous medium used in hysteroscopy. It is best suited for diagnostic rather than operative hysteroscopy. Since gas bubbles form in association with intrauterine bleeding and impaired visualization, it provides a clear field of view and is rapidly absorbed. It can, however, cause a gas embolism and often results in shoulder pain. Safety measures include only using a specific insufflator for hysteroscopy and limiting the flow rate and intrauterine pressure. Low viscosity fluids are used for uterine distension during hysteroscopy. There are two types of low viscosity distending media, those that contain electrolytes and those that do not. The electrolyte containing media include normal saline and lactated ringer solution. These can be used with mechanical morselators, mechanical tissue removal systems, laser or bipolar energy, and cannot be used with monopolar electrosurgery because they conduct electric current. The electrolyte fluids used for hysteroscopy are isotonic and thus do not disturb the osmolar balance between intracellular and extracellular fluid. While the risks of fluid absorption are associated mainly with electrolyte-poor fluids, intraversation of large volumes of electrolyte fluid 
can also lead to fluid overload. The electrolyte poor fluids that are used most commonly for hysteroscopy are 1.5% lysine, 3% sorbitol, and 5% mannitol. All the electrolyte poor fluids used in hysteroscopy can lead to hyponatremia if a large volume is absorbed. Mannitol differs from the others because it is isoosmolar but is not commonly used because it is not available in 3 litre bags typically used for hysteroscopy. In order to avoid hyponatremia and fluid overload, it is important to monitor the fluid deficit. The fluid deficit is essentially the difference between the fluid installed and the fluid collected from the outflow. In other words, the net systemic absorption. Furthermore, the intrauterine pressure can be titrated to aid visualization, but also limited to avoid complications. Inflow and monitoring are essentially controlled by the hysteroscope and a continuous fluid monitoring device. A hysteroscope that has a dual outer sheet or dual port system with an outflow port that can be directly connected to a vacuum collecting system gives a more accurate assessment of the fluid deficit as less media is lost in the drapes, towels or on the operating floor. Two systems exist, manual systems and automated systems. Where automated systems are not available, the manual technique is used. Fluid is infused using the force of gravity or by placing the fluid in a pressure bag. Fluid input and output are then recorded manually. The use of an automated fluid pump with long procedures such as an immutual resection or myomectomy is advocated by most international bodies. Automated systems have the following advantages over manual setups. The fluid deficit is continually measured with automated alerts. Inflow of fluid will automatically stop when the fluid deficit is reached. The intrauterine pressure is measured and can be titrated and it reduces the risk of air emboli. Titrating intrauterine pressure is important to manage bleeding, facilitate full resection of endometrial lesions, and decrease so-called false negative views of the endometrial cavity. These may occur with higher or constant endometrial pressure. The surgeon should use the lowest pressure that allows optimal visualization. Typical intrauterine pressure ranges from 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Higher pressures of up to 125 to 150 millimeters of mercury may be required for patients with intrauterine bleeding, large intercavitary blood clots, or other debris, or a uterine wall that is less compliant than average, or a uterus that is large or has intramural fibroids. A higher intrauterine pressure may result in increased absorption or extravasation of distending medium. Thus, if a higher pressure is used, fluid deficit should be monitored closely. The procedure should be performed as quickly as possible, and the pressure should be lowered if the higher pressure is no longer needed. So what do we actually use hysteroscopy for? For evaluation or treatment of the endometrial cavity, tubal ostea, or endocervical canal in women with abnormal premenopausal or postmenopausal uterine bleeding, endometrial thickening or polyps, submucosal and some intramural fibroids, intrauterine adhesions, malarian anomalies such as uterine septum, retained intrauterine contraceptives or other foreign bodies retained products of conception, a desire for sterilization, and those with endocervical lesions. There are several approaches to evaluating women with abnormal uterine bleeding or intrauterine lesions. One can do pelvic sonography, saline infusion sonography, endometrial sampling, or hysterosalpingography. By using hysteroscopy for the initial evaluation, one can potentially combine evaluation with treatment. Furthermore, hysteroscopy avoids the risk of missing focal pathology, as may occur with blind ending endometrial sampling. Alternatively, hysteroscopy can be used to further evaluate or treat lesions 
identified on imaging studies, or to confirm the absence of disease when symptoms persist and initial diagnostic tests are normal. However, hysteroscopy cannot assess myometrial disease like adenomyoses or tubal pathology or the external uterine contour, and therefore it is not sufficient for evaluation of these anatomic structures during an infertility evaluation and additional procedures like laparoscopy or hysterosalpingography are necessary. The contraindications to hysteroscopy include a viable intrauterine pregnancy, an active pelvic infection, this includes genital herpes infection, and a known cervical or uterine cancer. It should be noted that while hysteroscopy should not be performed in a patient with a viable intrauterine pregnancy, postpartum or postabortal hysteroscopy is sometimes useful for evaluation and treatment of retained products of conception. Excessive uterine bleeding may limit visualization during hysteroscopy, but it is not a contraindication. Some medical comorbidities are also potential contraindications to hysteroscopic surgery. However, since this is a minimally invasive procedure, it is really contraindicated in a few women. Outpatient settings are increasingly common for diagnostic and some operative hysteroscopy, for example, the removal of small lesions or adhesions. It is time-saving and cost-effective compared with operating room procedures and should be used whenever feasible. The most common reasons for failure to complete an outpatient hysteroscopy are pain, cervical stenosis, and poor visualization. In order to ensure successful outpatient hysteroscopy, one should exclude patients with cervical stenoses, limited mobility that impedes positioning, comorbidities that require intensive monitoring, or who cannot tolerate the procedure with the local anesthetic. It is also important to provide anticipatory guidance about the degree and duration of discomfort. Verbal reassurance during the procedure is also helpful. Outpatient hysteroscopies should be brief and only diagnostic or minor operative procedures. Should also be done with minimal intraoperative pain. Patients may benefit from pretreatment with a prostaglandin the night before the procedure and narrow caliber hysteroscopes with of four millimeter or less should be used. When considering hysteroscopy, women should be counseled about alternative diagnostic or treatment approaches and informed consent regarding expected treatment success and possible complications should be taken. This should include the possible need to abandon or prematurely stop a procedure due to fluid overload, and since uterine perforation is a possible complication, patients should consent to a possible laparoscopy or laparotomy if it becomes necessary to rule out visceral or vascular injury. When evaluating patients for hysteroscopy, a medical history is taken, which includes detailed questions regarding symptoms that relate to the indication for the procedure, obstetric and surgical history, and medical comorbidities, medications and allergies. A complete pelvic and general physical examination should be performed with particular attention to the size and mobility of the uterus and patency of the cervix. Pregnancy testing is performed and cervical cultures are appropriate if cervicitis is suspected. Hysteroscopy for premenopausal women with regular menstrual cycles should be done in the proliferative, or in other words, follicular phase, as this renders the best visualization of the uterine cavity. During the secretory phase, the thick endometrium can mimic endometrial polyps and can lead to inaccurate diagnoses. Furthermore, during menstruation, blood may interfere with visualization. In reproductive age women with irregular uterine bleeding, the ideal time for the procedure is unpredictable. Thus, patients should be counseled that a procedure may be attempted, but may be rescheduled if obscuring blood makes it impossible to evaluate the uterine cavity. Often surgery is still feasible because fluid pumps facilitate visualization by rapidly clearing debris and blood. Another approach is pharmacologic thinning of the endometrium. 
However, thinning agents should only be used when the surgeon plans operative hysteroscopy, resection of a limoma or endometrial ablation. Thinning agents should not be used when diagnostic hysteroscopy alone is planned, as these hormones may influence the histology of the endometrium. The most commonly used agents are estrogen progestin contraceptives or progestins alone. For postmenopausal women, hysteroscopy may be performed at any time. Adequate cervical dilation is an important step in hysteroscopy, as nearly 50% of hysteroscopic complications are associated with difficult passage of the hysteroscope through the cervical canal. Women who benefit from cervical dilation include those having procedures with larger hysteroscopes, women with a history of cervical stenosis or cervical surgery, and postmenopausal women. Cervical dilation can be done mechanically at the time of the procedure with dilators or done preoperatively with cervical ripening agents such as misoprostol or dinoprostone or vaginal osmotic dilators, namely laminaria. Preoperative dilation is generally preferred because it avoids or reduces the need for mechanical dilation and the associated risks of pain, uterine perforation and false tract creation. Prophylactic antibiotics are not routinely administered during hysteroscopy for prevention of surgical site infection or endocarditis, since post-hysteroscopy infection occurs in less than 1% of women. Sterile preparation is done with povidine iodine solution. Most women are able to undergo diagnostic hysteroscopy without anesthesia. Not using anesthesia appears particularly appropriate for diagnostic procedures when using a hysteroscope that is less than 4 mm in diameter. For women undergoing simple operative hysteroscopy, for example, removal of an intrauterine device, or hysteroscopy with the hysteroscope 4 mm or larger, a paracervical block is preferred as it is low cost, well tolerated, and reduces some aspects of pain. Women undergoing operative hysteroscopy with intrauterine procedures like myomectomy typically require additional pain control beyond that provided by a paracervical block. Options include conscious sedation and regional or general anesthesia. The procedure. A transurethral catheter is only placed when intensive monitoring of uterine output is necessary, for example, with prolonged procedures with excessive fluid absorption. So the initial steps for all hysteroscopic procedures are the same as for other transcervical procedures. The patient should be positioned in dorsal lithotomy, the speculum is placed, and the use of a tenaculum and mechanical dilation as required. The cervix should not be dilated beyond the size of the hysteroscope, since this may lead to le leakage of distending medium. Next, the hysteroscope is inserted through the cervical os under direct vision and the speculum is removed. Some experts, however, advocate an alternative approach to the classic initial entry technique, particularly for diagnostic procedures, the so-called vaginoscopic technique. The vaginoscopic or no-touch technique is performed without a speculum or tenaculum and without anesthesia. Women with cervical stenosis are not candidates for this approach. To perform the vaginoscopic technique, perform a bimanual pelvic examination with the patient in the dorsal lithotomy position, prepare the vaginal introitus with saline or povidine iodine, without using a speculum, introduce a rigid or semi-rigid narrow caliber hysteroscope into the vaginal introitus. Infuse normal saline at a pressure of 150 millimeters of mercury. Close the labia minora manually if needed to contain the distending media. Visualize the cervix and direct the hysteroscope through the cervical canal into the uterine cavity. Now all the structures should be inspected. The endocervix can easily be inspected during insertion of the hysteroscope. 
Any lesions that warrant further evaluation can be visualized by withdrawing the hysteroscope to the lesion site. Once the hysteroscope is within the endometrial cavity, the uterine cavity is distended. The entire cavity is inspected, including the tubal ostia and any pathology. Whether using a gaseous or fluid medium, after initial uterine distension, deflate the endometrial cavity. This will prevent negative hysteroscopic view, or in other words, flattening of lesions by the pressure of distension, thereby making them difficult to see. In general, 1-3% to of benign or malignant endometrial lesions are missed on hysteroscopy. To avoid missing uterine pathology, endometrial sampling should be performed in patients with global endometrial pathology or in those with persistent bleeding and no hysteroscopic findings. Women with focal pathology should undergo hysteroscopically directed removal of lesions. Most patients experience post-operative cramping or light bleeding, and some complain of vaginal discomfort. Carbon dioxide distension can cause referred shoulder pain, but this typically resolves within 15 minutes. Paracetamol or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are usually adequate for post-operative pain control, if necessary. The patient may resume most of her normal activities within 24 hours, and review of pathology results should be arranged. Here is some of the pathology seen on hysteroscopy. A polyp, a submucous fibroid, endometrial carcinoma, a septum, and an adhesion. I will now briefly show some of the more complicated hysteroscopic procedures. Firstly, endometrial ablation. It is the surgical destruction of the uterine lining and can be accomplished under hysteroscopic visualization using resectoscopic instruments to ablate or resect the endometrium. Or with non-resectoscopic ablation device, which is inserted into the uterine cavity and delivers energy to uniformly destroy the uterine lining. Non-resectoscopic endometrial ablation techniques are more widely practiced than resectoscopic ablation, since they require less specialized training and often have shorter operative time. Endometrial ablation is not appropriate for women with endometrial hyperplasia or cancer, or those who wish to preserve their fertility. Next, hysteroscopic myomectomy. Hysteroscopic myomectomy is performed to remove intracavitary fibroids, a term that refers to submucosal lymohomas and some intramural lymohomas, for which most of the fibroid protrudes into the uterine cavity. It is minimally invasive procedure that is the procedure of choice for appropriate candidates. Appropriate candidates for hysteroscopic myomectomy are women with symptomatic uterine fibroids and those that can be removed by hysteroscopy alone and also do not require additional surgery to remove other fibroids in other locations or treat other pathologies. The most common indications for hysteroscopic myomectomy are abnormal uterine bleeding, recurrent pregnancy loss and infertility. There are three methods used. Firstly, the wired loop resectoscope technique. This is used most commonly. The second method used is by use of a hysteroscopic tissue extraction device, also referred to as a morselator. It utilizes a rotary blade for resection and suction tubing to remove tissue fragments, 
There are no data or guidelines regarding the risk of dissemination of potentially malignant tissue with hysteroscopic tissue extraction devices, as with laparoscopic mucillation of uterine limohomas. The risk of this is likely lower since the uterus is mostly contained, although tissue and fluid may extrude from the fallopian tubes. The last method is by use of vaporization electrodes. These can be used with a monopolar or bipolar hysteroscope, and they operate at a higher power density and thereby vaporize the tissue. This eliminates the accumulation of tissue fragments that can occlude the view. However, it also prohibits evaluation of the tissue for pathology. Clinically, these devices are useful to desiccate the fibroid, making it smaller, and then exchange the vaporization e electrode for a wire loop to complete the procedure. In so doing, histologic retrieval is possible. In addition, vaporization may lead to the formation of bubbles in the distension fluid, thereby interfering with visualization. Complications from hysteroscopy are rare. One multi-center study of 92 centers and over 21,000 operative hysteroscopic procedures reported a complication rate of only 0.22%. Most common complications was perforation of the uterus, followed by fluid overload, intraoperative hemorrhage, bowel and bladder injury, and endomyometritis. As mentioned, uterine perforation is the most common complication of hysteroscopy. A uterine perforation can occur during mechanical cervical dilation or insertion of the hysteroscope. Such a perforation may be recognized when an instrument passes beyond depth of the uterine fundus, when there is sudden loss of visualization, when omentum or bowel or peritoneal structures can be visualized at the uterine fundus, or when there is sudden increase in the fluid deficit. Complications related to distending media vary according to the patient population, length of procedure, size of intracavitary pathology, depth of fibroid penetration into the myometrium, creation of false tracts or cervical laceration, type of pathology, for instance, polyp versus fibroid, and the medium used. A patient's ability to adapt to fluid overload varies with age and comorbid conditions. Absorption of large volumes of electrolyte poor fluid may result in the following complications. Volume overload presenting as acute decompensated heart failure, pulmonary edema, laryngeal edema, or a dilutional anemia, electrolyte or other plasma imbalances such as hyponatremia, hyperosmolality, hyperammonemia, hyperglycemia, acidosis, and some neurological sequelae like slurred speech, visual disturbance, hypersomnia, confusion, seizure, and coma. Fluid overload and electrolyte imbalance can be prevented by following several operative principles. These include the use of isoosmolar electrolyte fluids whenever possible, limiting the amount of preoperative intravenous fluids, advising anesthesia to minimize intraoperative fluids, especially when large myomas or deep hysteroscopic resection is anticipated, monitoring fluid deficit closely and halting the procedure and evaluating for fluid-related complications at preset thresholds, Maintaining the lowest intrauterine fluid pressure to achieve excellent visualization and limiting surgical time to less than an hour. Gas embolism may result in cardiovascular collapse or pulmonary edema, but few hysteroscopy patients experience clinically significant cardiac or pulmonary complications. Gas embolism may result from use of carbon dioxide for distension. It may also occur with either gas or fluid media with introduction of air through the open cervix or with removal and reinsertion of instruments or tissue, or alternatively, through creation of gas bubbles with electrosurgical vaporization of tissue. Preventative steps for gas embolism during hysteroscopy include keeping the patient in flat or reverse Trendelenburg position, avoiding Trendelenburg position and the use of nitrous oxide for anesthesia, purging air from all tubing prior to the insertion into the uterus, 
maintaining intrauterine pressure at less than 125 to 150 millimeters of mercury, limiting removal and reintroduction of the estroscope, and removal of intrauterine gas bubbles, ideally with a continuous outflow system. This brings me to the end of my talk. Here are my references and some more.